Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about the gimlet and drinking some. <laughs> of course. That was a sneak peek to the cocktail. First, very quickly, thank you once again to all of our Patreon supporters, and in particular to the newest Patreon supporter, Jesper Rosenkild. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks. Second, it's been a little while since we've mentioned the Humanities Podcasters group that we're part of, the group of independent podcasters who talk about all sorts of different topics, from history and language like ours, to myth, to art history, to philosophy, to music. There's a wide range of really, really fascinating podcasts out there. So we're just going to play a very short promo to remind you of that group, and then we'll continue with our episode. If you like this podcast, you might be interested in other podcasts that focus on the humanities. In fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag humanities podcasts, you'll find plenty of shows on history, language, literature, philosophy, art, and more. These are podcasts by people who enjoy telling stories, exploring the arts in our world, and who want to share their knowledge. Some examples of the podcasts you'll find are Myth Take, focusing on Greek mythology, The Feast Podcast, which talks about great meals and history, or The Lonely Palette, an art history podcast. Search hashtag Humanities Podcast today, or follow Humanities Podcasters on Twitter. And if you're a Humanities Podcaster, use the hashtag in your tweets so others can find you. And now to the featured beverage of the episode, which is pretty obvious, I guess. So we're drinking gimlets, and that is the topic of the episode as well. We're going to be playing the voiceover from an older video about the gimlet and the origin of the cocktail name and a lot of other information. So of course we had to drink gimlets. Indeed. Now gimlet is a classic drink. Yep. It's made with two parts gin and one part rose's lime cordial. Of course, the cocktail aficionados would probably say you should make your own lime cordial rather than using the bottled kind. So you can certainly do that if you wish. Mm -hmm. Or use some of the craft cocktail mixes that are now in existence. There's some lime cordials from various uh, people who make craft cordials and syrups. Personally, I love rose's lime. <laughs> and, and it is the, you know, the traditional company, the traditional brand. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance the recipe has changed over the years, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit, so that what we're drinking now is not the same, but then neither is the gin, which we'll probably talk about as well. Right. <laughs> so I've admitted my lack of cocktail snobbery to you. Anyway, this is one of my favorite drinks. Yes, it's quite, quite good. We have it frequently. It's just refreshing and tasty and balanced, and I love it. Cheers. Cheers. Let us then turn... Without further ado, to the voiceover from the video in the cocktail series, Gimlet, and listen to that, and then we'll return with more information on various things that weren't covered fully in the voiceover. A Gimlet is a classic cocktail made with gin and lime cordial. All of the suggested origins for the name have to do with scurvy. Scurvy is a disease caused by the lack of vitamin C, which is necessary for forming connective tissue. The symptoms include swollen and bleeding gums, lost teeth, and the reopening of old wounds. Horrible stuff. Since the fresh fruit and vegetables that are rich in vitamin C were hard to preserve before refrigeration, scurvy was a particular challenge for sailors during the early days of European exploration and colonization. And that colonization was big business, literally. To more effectively take advantage of the very lucrative trade from around the world now possible because of advances in sailing technology, the European powers began to set up the world's first multinational corporations, which were granted trade monopolies. Among the first were the British East India Company, founded in 1600, and the Dutch East India Company, founded in 1602. These companies, which were the first to issue stock, and thus kick off the whole stock market thing, grew to be almost quasi-governments themselves, with their own armies, currencies, and legal systems. They had the power to wage wars, found new colonies, and hold and punish prisoners so you can see why they wouldn't want to lose their profits because their sailors were getting sick on those long sea voyages bringing the goods back home. Fortunately, they eventually hit upon a way of preventing scurvy. Though Royal Navy physician James Lind is often credited with establishing the link between citrus fruit and scurvy protection, 
He was neither the first to suggest this, nor did he really seem to understand the direct connection. Others before Lind, such as Surgeon John Woodall, who stocked medical chests for the British East India Company and wrote The Surgeon's Mate, a medical manual for ship's surgeons, had already recommended citrus to treat scurvy, and later on it was Gilbert Blaine who finally convinced the Royal Navy to adopt citrus juice as a treatment. Lind himself thought that there might be multiple causes for the disease, and recommended various dietary and environmental improvements, including citrus in a preserve form that would actually have made it ineffective. Still, Lind's experiments on scurvy were perhaps the first controlled clinical trials in medical history, and so it eventually became common practice to issue sailors with rations of citrus, particularly lime juice. This had sometimes already been added to the daily ration of watered-down rum given to sailors in the Royal Navy, a mixture called grog, a practice started by Admiral Edward Vernon in the 18th century. Vernon had the nickname Old Grog because of his habit of wearing a coat made out of a coarse fabric known as grogrum, so called from the French gros grain, meaning coarse grain. This nickname was then transferred to Vernon's watered-down rum mixture, giving us grog, but the Navy wasn't at first aware of the scurvy-busting benefits of the lime juice, which was just added to mask the bad taste of the water grown stagnant on the long ocean voyages. But eventually the Merchant Shipping Act of 1867 required lime rations for all the sailors in the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy. By the 19th century the practice had earned British sailors the nickname of lime juicers, or simply limeys, which later came to be used of any Brit, not just sailors. So they had a treatment for scurvy all well and good, but preservation was still something of a problem over long voyages. Fortunately Lachlan Rose, a member of a prominent Scottish shipbuilding family, set up a branch of the family business provisioning ships and invented a way of preserving lime juice without the need for alcohol, and he, perhaps not coincidentally, patented this method in 1867, the same year as the Merchant Shipping Act. We now know this as Rose's Lime Cordial, one of the essential ingredients in a gimlet. But what does all this have to do with the name of the drink? Well, the first meaning of the word gimlet is a small drill or auger. So one idea is that the gimlet was used to tap the kegs of lime juice. The word gimlet, which may ultimately come from a Proto-Indo-European root which means to turn, and also gives us such words as wave, wipe, whip, and vibrate, comes into English from the Dutch word wimmel, meaning auger. Remember the Dutch, Britain's main rival in seafaring and trade way back with the British and Dutch East India companies? Well, because of ongoing trade and trade rivalry, English has quite a few words borrowed from the Dutch over the years, many related to trade and seafaring such as halibut, pump, shore, skipper, avast, commodore, cruise, deck, smuggle, and yacht. So perhaps it's fitting that this drink that's so connected with British sailors may ultimately come from a Dutch word. But there's another story for where the name Gimlet comes from. According to this story, a British Navy surgeon named Thomas Gimlet, who later became Surgeon General, supposedly hit upon the idea of making the lime ration more palatable to the sailors by adding gin to it, and it is true that a Gimlet is traditionally made with gin not rum, as in grog. So according to this theory, the gimlet is named after this Dr. Thomas D. Gimlet. That's the story in the Royal Navy's own dictionary of naval slang known as Covey Crump, named after Royal Navy Commander A. Covey Crump who first compiled it in the 1950s, a useful resource for anyone interested in unusual slang. Whether or not the Dr. Gimlet story is true, gin is certainly an essential part of the gimlet, and once again we have the Dutch to thank, both for the gin itself and for its name. Gin developed from the earlier spirit known as Genever, a liquor flavoured with juniper berries that was invented in the Netherlands. Supposedly the English started to refer to this drink as Dutch Courage during the Thirty Years' War, either in reference to its warming effects, or somewhat derisively as the source of the bravery of the Dutch soldiers. In any case it was eventually imported to Britain, thanks in part to Dutch-born William of Orange, who came to be William III of England in the late 17th century and this kicked off the gin craze in England, with the ruinous new drink being depicted as displacing the wholesome British beer, most famously in William Hogarth's Gin Lane and Beer Street. And as for the name gin, it's a shortening of Jennifer, which is the Dutch word for juniper, but because of the similar sound it was anglicised as Geneva, like the Swiss city to which it is not otherwise related. But don't worry, the city Geneva will come up in its own right later on. But gin is involved in this story in another way too in connection with another attempted cure for scurvy. English theologian and chemist Joseph Priestley, most famous for discovering oxygen, also invented soda water, which he erroneously thought might be a treatment for scurvy, so he sent it along on James Cook's second voyage to the South Seas. Though it didn't pan out as a cure for scurvy, it did have a role to play in dealing with the other major disease colonial powers like Britain and the Netherlands have to deal with, malaria. 
In the 17th century the Spanish had learned that the Quechua people of Peru use the bark of the cincona tree to treat malaria, the Quechua word for bark being quina, whence the word quinine, another etymology for you. And eventually the Dutch, yes them again, acquired the seeds from the cincona tree and were the first to cultivate it outside Peru in their colony in Java, thus ensuring a steady supply of the quinine powder which had become crucial to European countries wanting to maintain their ever so profitable tropical colonies. Now this is all a bit complicated, but back to soda water, which Priestley failed to capitalize on. Instead another man did, a man who made his fortune as a jeweler in Geneva. Told you Geneva would actually come back into this. This man, Jacob Schwepp, yes that Schwepp, figured out a way of mass producing carbonated mineral water based on Priestley's earlier work, thus founding the soft drink industry. Erasmus Darwin, physician, grandfather of evolutionist Charles, and along with Schwepp, a key member of the Lunar Society, a group of industrialists and scientists who were the driving force behind the English Industrial Revolution, promoted Schwepp's carbonated mineral water for its health giving effects. And it was just the thing for the malaria problem in the colonies, since the British soldiers in India took to mixing the very bitter quinine powder with sugary carbonated water and a bit of gin to make it go down more smoothly. Problem solved, and eventually a businessman named Erasmus Bond, no, not Erasmus Darwin, Bond, Erasmus Bond, marketed the first tonic water with quinine already mixed in, in 1858, the very year Britain took direct control over India after the Sepoy Mutiny led to the dissolution of the British East India Company. And shortly thereafter the Schweppes Company began producing their own tonic water marketed specifically for the British in India. So a treatment for malaria and the classic cocktail the gin and tonic all thanks to a failed treatment for scurvy, and all a byproduct of British colonialism. But back to the cocktail we started with, the gimlet, there's another possible reason that this name for a drilling tool was applied to the drink. It might be a metaphor based on the penetrating effects of the drink. The word gimlet was frequently used figuratively in this way, particularly in the expression gimlet-eyed, which first appeared in the 18th century to refer to someone who has a squinting or piercing gaze. One particularly famous person who had the nickname Old Gimlet Eye, as well as the Fighting Quaker, was the amazingly named Smedley Darlington Butler, Major General in the United States Marine Corps in the early part of the 20th century. He was particularly involved in activities in tropical locales such as the Caribbean and Central and South America, and incidentally took care to ensure his troops took quinine to prevent malaria, which later on became something of a problem for the US military in World War II when they lost control of territories which produced it. Notably, Butler was involved in the so-called Banana Wars, a series of military interventions in the Caribbean and Central America to protect US business interests, particularly those of fruit producing companies, in those regions. He would later become outspokenly critical of US imperialism and business interests driving US foreign policies, saying that he'd been turned into a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. He is also particularly famous for exposing the so-called business plot an alleged fascist plan to overthrow the US government bankrolled by some very major American businessmen. Though the true extent of this plot, whether it was exaggerated, a hoax, or genuinely conceived, has never been fully established, it still goes to show the potentially ominous power of business joined with imperialism, even if those forces also gave us cocktails such as the gimlet and the gin and tonic. Think about that as you enjoy your drink. Tasty. <laughs> and preventative of scurvy, which yes, lovely. <laughs> I probably was not at risk of having, to be fair. <laughs> so to fill in a few more details about the word gimlet, the word was used in its drill or boring tool sense. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to pause to point out your boring insistence tool. on using, or your attempt to try to use boring, the phrase bor <laughs> gimlet, a boring, no, boring tool, tool, but not a boring... <laughs> Drink? Yes. <laughs> it's a boring story. I'm sorry. Yeah, the pun, it just, I see it, but it just doesn't work. Sorry, go on. Well, it was used in that sense from the 15th century. Uh, the first OED citation is from John Lydgate. In the sort of figurative sense, it's used from, well, in the 20th century by Thomas Hardy, but in that specific phrase, gimlet eyed. Yes. That, as I said, dates to the uh, 18th century. Mm hmm. But the drink usage is what I really want to focus on. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's, it, it doesn't really occur until the 20th century. The earliest citation that the Oxford English Dictionary has is 1928. Right. And the quotation is specifically, the gimlet we were introduced to at the golf club. And it proved to be the well and flavorably known Ricky, 
but described as gin, a spot of lime, and soda. Oh, okay. So that's not the same. It's So it doesn't sound quite the same gimlet that we know. No, that is a lime ricky. A gin ricky. A gin that's, ricky. Yeah. yeah. In any case, that's the earliest use of the word gimlet to refer to a cocktail. And it's in a book by D.B. Wesson, mm -hmm. specifically, and I, I spent a surprising amount of time tracking this guy down because he's kind of obscure. Mm -hmm. Douglas Bertram Wesson, who appears to be the grandson of Daniel Baird Wesson of Smith oh, well, and Wesson. Oh, okay. The, the gun manufacturers. Right. And he was a, appears to be, have been a minor author in his day. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote that one book that, that uses the word the gimlet in it. It appears to be a golf book. <laughs> right, okay. Called, and, and this is a great title, I'll Never Be Cured and I Don't Much Care, The History of an Acute Attack of Golf and Pertinent Remarks Relating to Various Places of Treatment. <laughs> That's sort of Woodhouseian. It does sound sort of Woodhouseian, doesn't it? And it's an obscure book that I couldn't really uh, get my hands on, but I'm sort of curious now to uh, <laughs> to read the thing. But as that quotation made clear, he, he it was at the golf club that yeah. um, the gimlet was served. Uh, he's an American author, obviously. And the other book that I could track down that he wrote was a book called Bullet Holes, A Record of Records. And I don't know anything about it, but it seems like it might be something about the Smith and Wesson company oh okay okay and maybe of like records in the sense of setting records maybe maybe i don't know hmm. but it is interesting that that first reference contains soda water yes right that does link back links here. back to the this whole soda water side of the uh, cure potential cure for uh, scurvy mm -hmm. the second citation that the oed lists though this is by no means the next early. There, there are, uh, I think, other references to the cocktail and its ingredients. Okay. But in any case, the OED has a quotation from Noel Coward from his the first volume of his memoirs, Present Indicative, standing about in the wardroom, accepting with gracious melancholy gimlet after gimlet. <laughs> See, that's the thing about Coward, right? Don't you now immediately want that to describe yes. your life? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But the third citation that the OED lists makes clear the contents of a gimlet. It's from uh, Raymond Chandler's The Long Goodbye, a very famous novel. Mm -hmm. A real gimlet is half gin and half Rose's lime juice and nothing else. And indeed, the earlier recipes apparently are always half and half. That's not surprising, really, given that the point is that it's a vehicle for Rose's lime. Yes. And also that that's just a lot easier to measure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so apparently all the earlier cocktail book recipes are in that proportion. I wonder if also, well, this is pushing it, but if you're using navy strength gin. Ah, that's true. It could be overproof. Navy strength gin is is overproof. You can water it down. Well, okay, yes, but the proof, I guess it's overproof for that reason, but also the whole concept of proof comes from the idea that if the alcohol fell on the gunpowder, spilled oh. on the gunpowder, it would still light. So you light. proved that it was strong enough by putting some on some gunpowder and igniting it. And if it would still light, then it was good because otherwise it was too dangerous to have kegs of rum and other things. And but that's a nice etymology on top of it. Now, you go look that up. I just got that from a book on gin that I will mention again later, but that is my understanding will, of where proof comes from. I will double check that. But, uh, now, exactly how that relates to Navy strength as opposed to regular strength, I don't know. Right. But I do okay. know that Navy strength uh, is... rum at least is a thing right. and it's overproof okay so i suppose if the gin was a, was navy strength it might have you might have wanted to put more rose of lime into it but in any case uh it is specifically rose's lime not just lime juice or right right that justifies our use of this our use of the rose's lime so you will note in that insert that i pronounced the word quinine and this was a decision that i you had to come to you i had, had to, to come to, to i had to yeah. think about for a while my first instinct was actually to say quinine. And then I thought, why am I saying it that way? And I sort of looked it up and found there's a number of different pronunciations. The usual British pronunciation is quinine, which is what I ended up going with in the end. Mm -hmm. The American, what is usually labeled as the American pronunciation is quinine. The mixed pronunciation of quinine I have a theory, maybe a Canadianism. I, I don't have a lot of data to back this up. But so here's my question to listeners. How do you pronounce that word? And where do you come from? 
Right. You tried to do this in a poll, didn't I you? I did at the time. At the time when you I don't have a lot of video. data points here, but it certainly backs up the notion that quinine is the standard British pronunciation and quinine is the standard American pronunciation. But I'd love to get more data on this. And if the, if you do pronounce it with that kind of mixed pronunciation between the, the British and the American quinine, I, I would certainly like to hear about it. It would not at all be surprising given the Amer the Canadian is often a bastardized, <laughs> a bastardized mingling of mingling British and of American, British American. Yeah, with could be. a generalized uncertainty as to which to follow. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, all of them sound right to me. Right. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't. You've heard I don't have all. an instinct about yeah. it because mm -hmm. they all. I. I probably say quinine. No, I was about to say I say quinine, but then I said quinine. So clearly, I don't know what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so. You had something about where that word comes from. I mean, you mentioned that in the video, but... Yes. And specifically, what I'm interested in is the etymology of its sign, its botanical name, mm -hmm. which is not the same. This, so, I, as I said, the word synchona, mm -hmm. which is the botanical name, is not related to quinine, even though they sort of sound vaguely similar. They sound enough similar, enough similar that you, that you can might imagine think, oh, Europeans being dumb and yeah. ending up with it. Yeah. But in fact, as I said in the, in the uh, insert, quinine comes from... Uh, Quechua root, uh, kina, but the botanical name cinchona was applied to the, the plant by Carl Linnaeus, the famous taxonomist. Mm -hmm. He named it after the Spanish Countess of Chinchon. He got the name slightly garbled <laughs> to get cinchona mm -hmm. from it. But in any case, she was cured by the, the bark in question in 1638 while she was in Peru and brought it back with her to Spain. And that's, I think, how it made it to Europe. Oh, okay. Interesting. When was that? 1638. Okay. So I was just reading, so there's this book that uh, I think you might have been given as a birthday yes. present, yes. in fact. Yes, it was given to me. But I have read it as well. And it's a book called Gin, Glorious Gin, How Mother's Ruin Became the Spirit of London by <laughs> Olivia Williams. And it's a history of gin, as it's clear. And very specifically, it's a history of gin and the city of London. It's you know very localized and it talks about gin in general, but it also focuses on how it shaped and was shaped by the very specific locations of London and particular bars and distilleries and the history of distilleries in London and how you know London dry gin was a London dry gin, which is a type of gin we still call London dry, but almost none of the distilleries are now in London, but it's called that because they were distilleries in London. Right. It's a very good book. It's quite an easy read, and I definitely recommend it. And I'm not going to talk about all the stuff in it because there's lots of history of gin. I mean, gin is a really culturally rich drink, and there's a huge amount of stuff. You, you gesture at it with the Mother's Ruin stuff and the gin craze and William of Orange and all of that. Right. And there's a lot more that could be said. But there's one little chapter in the book that I did want to talk about because it is about this exact thing, quinine. And specifically about the first cinchona tree that was grown in Britain, which Williams records as being in 1685. So not much later. No. It doesn't take long for it to And to she get, said it was in, the, in Chelsea Physic Garden, which was where the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries trained its apprentices. And the head gardener at the time, John Watts, pioneered Europe's first heated greenhouse. Huh. Which was what allowed him to grow the a cinchona yeah. tree because mm -hmm. obviously that wouldn't have worked otherwise so we wouldn't know about that except that my favorite diarist <laughs> not samuel peeps but sir john evelyn will come up later on in this podcast good who was a diarist and founding member of the royal society and very very interested in horticulture in particular he visited this greenhouse and mentioned the tree bearing the Jesuit's bark, which was the cinchona right. tree. And this was its first cultivation outside of South America. So the bark had been brought back, but it had not yet been, been grown, grown outside okay. of South mm -hmm. America because how could it be without the technology of a heated greenhouse? Because, it's, right. you know, a normal greenhouse with just the sun. Probably even enough. in Spain, the climate is not sufficiently warm. I don't know, but I guess, you know, it probably needs quite specific conditions. Right. But the thing is that by 1731, when a sort of catalog and compendium of the plants that were in this garden mm. was written, this tree wasn't mentioned. 
and ah. nothing was said about it. Okay. So it must have died by 1731 at the latest. So it, it didn't become any kind of you know production line or anything. And of course, England never did produce quinine no. natively. And that was and a big indeed, part of their problem. The supply of quinine mm -hmm. has been a, a continual problem into the 20th century. Yeah. The place that was best at growing it was Java, and it was controlled by the Dutch. The Dutch. And that was a big yeah. problem. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was an interesting little quirk of history, that it was indeed cultivated in England, and I just like that John Evelyn was the one who yes. recorded it. Good. John Evelyn is a favorite of mine because I had a job as a research assistant while I was a graduate student transcribing a number of his letters, his letter copy books specifically, the places he copied down the letters that he was sending to other people. He copied mm. them down into his copy books before he sent them, and I was transcribing his handwriting. And With special attention to his use of Greek and Latin. Yes, I was transcribing and then I was translating the Greek and Latin and trying to identify the tags and the quotes, and his Greek was execrable. <laughs> I don't know if that's pronounced right. Horrible. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and his Latin was decent, but he was often referring to these patristic authors who were really hard to find. Anyway, it was very difficult. But I spent a lot of time over several summers with John Evelyn, so I have a great soft spot in my heart for him. The other thing that I wanted to mention in that same chapter, so she talks, I mean, that chapter is about the development of tonic and the relationship between gin and tonic, and of course, of malaria and all of that, which we'll get to in a moment. She also mentions in that same chapter, she ties it very closely to pink gin. Right. Because she says that pink gin was developed as a cure for seasickness, specifically. Oh, the bitters. The bitters. The bitters were considered a cure for seasickness. And the development of Angostura bitters goes along with sort of naval trade as well. And so that both pink gin and gin and tonic become these very, very iconic colonial drinks. Yeah. And the drinks of those in the colonies and those who have spent time in India and spent time overseas and who come back to England and can only be colonial overlords, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and come back and miss the pink gins. And so yes. it becomes the signifier of the colonial mentality mm -hmm. of the Raj mm -hmm. and other periods, gin and tonics, but also pink gin. Pink gin. Uh, pink gin, for those of you who don't know, is a cocktail, which is very simple. It's just gin with Angostura bitters liberal four or five dashes of Angostura bitters, which does turn it slightly pinkish. Now, were they using Angostura bitters from early on, or were they using other... She talks about the development of Angostura bitters specifically. Specifically, yeah. okay. I don't remember all of the details. I'd have to look that up. Right. Yeah. And she talks about Peychaud's, but that wasn't the one that the British were right. using. Yeah, that was an American. Right. So I don't, I don't think I'm going to go into all of the other... I could talk about gin <laughs> for so long. Let me just say, I love gin very much. You're, after all, the gin prof. I am the gin prof, as a colleague once referred to me as from my uh, posts on Twitter. She met me in person and said, ah, oh, yes, you're the gin prof. <laughs> thought, yeah, that's fair. I do like gin very much. I have been given bottles of gin for birthdays and Christmas for the last couple of years, and I appreciate every one of them. That's pretty much all I get, and I'm <laughs> fine with that. There has been a real resurgence in craft gins, and this is one of the things that this book, Gin, Glorious Gin, does talk about, about how they went through a period where gin in this, you know, mid-20th century, especially to the 70s and 80s, all the distilleries were closing down and everything was just becoming homogenized and bought up by big companies and there was just one or two types of gin and how in the last 10, 20 years, but especially the last 10 years really, a whole bunch of new distilleries have opened up in England and she does hardly talks about the American scene, but it's true there too. And in fact, there's a bunch of Canadian ones and we keep buying Every time I'm at the liquor store, if there's a new gin I haven't tried, I have to buy them. And the nice thing about gin is because it's made with botanicals. They can be quite different. They can yeah. be really quite different. I mean, there's only so much difference any vodka can have from any other vodka. And even rum, which can be, to be fair, quite different, quite different yes. with its aging and things like that. Still, there's not that many ingredients that go into it. But with gin, you can really radically change it as long as there's juniper in it. It almost can have almost anything else in it. Mm -hmm. And so there are some varieties that are really, really substantially different. And so I find that really fun. Though, as you alluded to earlier, London Dry has become the sort of default default mm -hmm. now. And it's hard sometimes to find, you know, some of the older styles like Old Tom Gin. Yes. So the classic styles were Old Tom Gin Ginevre. Yeah. which is the precursor of gin, mm -hmm. uh, which is still findable in Europe, but it's hard to find in North America now, and London Dry. Those were your classic types. Now there's an American style as well. Right. 
And then there's a whole bunch of just sort of craft gins that don't fall into any one particular, they don't call themselves any one style or mm -hmm. anything else. But yeah, Old Tom Gin has disappeared entirely for a while. Yeah, It's been revived by one distillery at least, maybe more in England, I'm not sure. Heyman's, but right? Heyman's is the one that was was available and is still available in some parts of North America. We managed to get a bottle once. Yeah, but these. it's no longer available in Ontario. Well, Can't get, get on that uh, Canadian liquor stores. <laughs> yeah. If anyone wants to send us a bottle of Heyman's Old Tom Gin, it's quite different. It's quite uh, sweet yeah. comparatively and has much less of the juniper mm -hmm. note to it. Anyway, as I said, I could talk about gin forever, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. But I do recommend that book very highly. Gin, Glorious Gin by Olivia Williams. So, of course, one of the themes of that insert was about the diseases that one encounters in a colonial situation mm -hmm. like that when European countries were grabbing land around the world. So I mentioned scurvy and malaria, and uh, those were two of the most significant diseases that they had to face. And so I, I thought I'd talk about the etymologies of those diseases. Mm -hmm. So scurvy is an interesting one. There are two kind of suggested etymologies, and both of them are quite interesting. So one suggestion is that it comes from Old Norse, skirbjörger. <laughs> so you, would, you might know the first part of that, skir. Like yogurt. Like yogurt, right? Which is, you know, the Icelandic fancy yogurt that's Icelandic in Icelandic yogurt that you'll find in fancy grocery, stores. fancy grocery stores. So literally it means sort of sour milk. Right. And bjogur means a swelling. Mm -hmm. So the swelling you get from drinking soured milk on long sea voyages is what this word seems to make. Ew. Mean. Yes. <laughs> And so the. I mean, I know scurvy's horrible already, so it shouldn't need anything more to make me go ew. But <laughs> ew. ew. <laughs> the thought of drinking sour milk oh, and becoming swollen, swollen. from it—that's oh. one suggestion. Mm -hmm. There's an alternate suggestion. According to the OED, it may come from Middle Dutch or Low German, basically meaning a disease that lacerates the belly because of the disfiguration that it causes. Oh, yeah. So from two words, schoren, meaning to lacerate, and buk, meaning belly. Also, not a pleasant image. No. I remember the discussion, actually, about how you were going to illustrate scurvy. I know, and I, I definitively did not want to use photographs. No, I know. I think that was completely the right choice, both because they are horrific. They truly are horrific. And those are like actual Real human people beings. who actually suffered mm -hmm. from it. I know. I, I, I think you made absolutely the right choice. So medical manual illustrations mm -hmm. seemed a little... They seemed off. Better. But I'm just thinking in looking at them yeah. and trying to decide what to do, it may, meant that we had to look at a number of, of illustrations the, of scurvy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we think of it now as being sort of almost a joke, or at least I do, because who's going to get scurvy? Yeah. But, oh, very bad. <laughs> well, the other illness that I discussed was malaria, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and this reflects the medical theories that were floating around at the time it comes mm -hmm. it means literally bad air yeah it's mal italian area right? yeah mala aria mm -hmm. bad air it's italian so it was probably first used by italian physician francisco torti mm -hmm. it was thought at the time that it was caused by sort of bad odors mm -hmm. bad atmosphere could cause a variety of diseases not just mm -hmm. malaria but indeed james lind thought that atmosphere may have played a part in scurvy as well yeah. So James Lind recommended a variety of sort of environmental fixes change to, to change. And so probably, you know, indirectly improved the conditions for the sailors because he recommended improved hygiene. Right. I'm sure there were lots of other things that were going wrong with sailors at the time, like infected cuts mm -hmm. and things like that and other diseases that if you could improve hygiene, it would help. Yeah. Yeah. And indeed, he, he probably did do some good. He, he was also trying to find cures for typhus. Mm -hmm. And the improved hygiene, I would imagine, would help, would help with typhus because yeah. typhus is transmitted by body lice. It's a bacteria, right. Right. but it's transmitted by body lice. So I would imagine that improved hygiene would alleviate that problem. It's a little bit, yeah. Typhus, by the way, while we're on the role of, uh, while we're on the subject of diseases. Such a lovely <laughs> topic, yes. Comes from Greek. The word was actually used for some kind of disease, possibly not the same disease. We don't know. Yeah, that's, um, that's a game that people love to play is identifying yeah. ancient diseases with modern diagnoses. Yeah. 
but Hippocrates, the, the very famous Greek physician, was the first to use that word. So typhus means sort of a stupor caused by fever, mm -hmm. and literally it means smoke. And for fans of the show, <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the Proto-Indo-European root that this comes from, Deu in turtle doves. Turtle doves. Tur doves. I thought of it. <laughs> the dove. Yeah. The smoky. The smoky bird. Right. Smoke puffs. Yes. Yeah. Smoke puffs. So typhus. I guess it's sort of you know smoky thinking or you know clouded thinking is the idea. Getting back to malaria. Yeah. So this idea of it being caused by bad air, as I said, goes back right to the ancient world. Right. So I thought I might say a couple of things about malaria in the ancient world because it is, and not by that name, of course, something we can trace back. And I found some interesting things. So malaria itself can't be tracked in bones and skeletal remains from the ancient world because it's a parasite, it lives in soft tissues, specifically in the blood. However, it can be tracked by the body's responses to it in populations in which it's endemic. So this is not something I knew until I looked for some information about mal malaria in the ancient world. However, that must have been fun. It was kind of interesting. So the source that I was looking at said malaria was most likely introduced into Greece during the Bronze Age from contact with malaria infested areas in North Africa and the Levant. So malaria starts in the tropics and it's carried though because it's carried by mosquitoes as soon as a population or some people become infected with malaria and then move to another place right. as long as there's a good enough habitat for the mosquitoes that carry it then it can mm -hmm. be transmitted so it can move and it moves through much of eastern mediterranean right so bronze age it seems to have come into and how can we tell well Evidence of malaria can be seen in the bones because of the chronic anemia that is a result of mutations in hemoglobin that are a reaction from a population's exposure to malaria. So basically what happens is when a population starts to be exposed to malaria, mm. there are certain a range of, please, if you're medical, please forgive the butchering <laughs> of the following information. There are a range of mutations to the hemoglobin, which is the cells that carry the red blood cells that carry oxygen in your blood that can happen, which make it impossible for the parasite to breed in your blood. I don't know the exact reasons why, but mm. basically they mutate in shape or something like that. Something changes in the hemoglobin. So there's a number of different mutations on their own. Any one of those mutations will essentially provide immunity from malaria, or at least a much lower response to malaria which is good. So a population will develop these mutations quite quickly once the disease becomes established. The problem is that if a child receives, you know, some combination of those mutations from both parents, hmm. they can result in severe anemia, which is the blood's inability to carry enough oxygen. Right. So there's a number of kinds. One is thalassemia, which is quite fatal and, and very severe. And then there's more moderate forms of severe and chronic anemia that those types of anemia show in the bones ah. so they produce markers in the bones they produce produce deform i don't know the details but deformation and various signals in in skeletal structure and sometimes early death so right. you can see it in child you know, populations of children's skeletons and things so this is one of the things that happens with populations that are exposed to malaria over a reasonable length of time you can start to see the development of these problems of severe anemia which are a result of the protective mutations right. or mutations that become protective once malaria exists and are therefore selected for but if they produce too much they cause problems right right so i thought first of all that was just fascinating yeah. to me that's something i didn't yeah. know about malaria and that explains why places in the world which have malaria it's still a problem but why the local populations are often not as severely affected right as newcomers because they are have some, some level of, it, of right. protection there are also and i'm not going to get into this because i didn't read very much about it but there are multiple types of malaria there are multiple types of the parasite some of which are much more severe than others hmm. so that can have an effect too on on population's ability right. to to be protected against it all that to say that while the studies on it have not been necessarily extensive throughout the ancient world, some studies have been done which can prove the existence of malaria or at least strongly suggest the existence of malaria in different places and times because as soon as you start to see these markers for this, these types of anemia, that's a good marker for malaria. Right. So I thought that was really interesting. And this is one of the reasons that they can trace it back to probably around the Bronze Age. So 
From the historical period, we know the malaria was in Greece. And then from there, it moved through much of the Mediterranean. Hmm. Now, they didn't call it malaria, of course. So what they called it was fevers, because that's the most obvious symptom of malaria, is fevers. And there were, in the ancient world, all of the medical sort of documentation lists many different kinds of fevers. And this is where the fact that there are multiple malarial infections matters because they're different ones. Malaria can recur. This is one of its most famous elements yeah. is that it rec recurs, that once you are infected with it once, it can recur on a sort of cycle. And that has to do with the life cycle of the infection. Mm -hmm. But the different ones, the, the most severe one doesn't really recur, but then the less severe ones do, or I mm -hmm. don't know. I don't know all the details. Mm -hmm. But so the various fevers, some of which are recurring, you can kind of figure out which ones probably refer to malaria because right. the doctors could you know, recognize these types of symptoms. Some of them are recurring, some of them are not, some of right. them are more, you know, all this. So there's a person who, R. Solares, who wrote Malaria and Rome in 2002, mm -hmm. which is a, it seems to be, a, I didn't read the whole thing. I was just looking at snippets of it. It seems to be a very sort of, extensive history of malaria in Italy from antiquity, but well into the modern period. So I just was looking at the Roman period and they didn't know it was carried by mosquitoes, but in the ancient world, they did think it was carried by bad air and they thought bad air was associated with swamps. swamps yeah. I mean, this is why it seemed like bad air. I mean, it's not stupid. There's a correlation it's there. not stupid yeah. at all to think that, you know, stinky yeah. air is unhealthy because the places with that stinky air were also usually wet. Yeah. and warm and overcrowded and, you know, did produce disease. Mm -hmm. It's just it wasn't, it was the vector was not air, it was mosquitoes. But that, that takes a lot of work to figure out. So the interesting thing is that Rome in particular has the strong association with malaria. And that's why it's not coincidental that it's an Italian word that we have for yeah. it. Yeah. From the very earliest period, there was a recognition that Rome, the seven hills of Rome, right? Well, the seven hills are joined by a bunch of valleys. Yeah. And there was this strong recognition that the hills of Rome were healthy. And we have Cicero, for instance, crediting Romulus for locating Rome in this healthy environs, specifically thinking of the hills. Right. The areas surrounding the hills, though, in the time of Cicero and Livy and other people were very clearly recognized as being unhealthy. All those valleys. And early on, they had drained the marshes and the, the wet areas that lay between the bulk of the hills. That's what the first sewer of Rome, the Cloaca Maxima, was built for. It wasn't built as a sewer like we think of sewers as for, you know, flushing toilets to. It was built to drain the marshy area right. and also to drain the runoff from the Tiber when it flooded. Because the Tiber flooded routinely right. until quite recently. And it was recognized that, that was extremely unhealthy. And so what you had in Rome was the situation where the wealthy lived on the hills and the poor lived in the valleys. And the poor died of fevers a lot. Right. And the wealthy didn't. Right. And what it was clearly was malaria. Right. I mean, there may have been other things as well. There's lots of other diseases, other diseases that can flourish sure. in those kinds yeah. of conditions. But it really seems to have been malaria. The interesting thing about that is it could work in Rome's favor sometimes. So there is a, seems to be speculative, but when the Gauls attacked Rome in the fourth century BC, they besieged Rome and they, and they were encamped besieging some of the hills of Rome and they were devastated by a sickness, fevers, probably malaria. Hmm. And that's one of the reasons they ended up withdrawing and not completely conquering Rome, or at least that's the story. Now that's a very semi-mythical story, so it's a bit hard to say. But later on in the Roman period, much later, because of course the Romans were not threatened seriously again other than Hannibal till much later. But in the later in late antiquity and into the medieval period, there's multiple places where besieging forces were ravaged by malaria or by disease and fevers to the point where they had to withdraw. Right. So it actually became protective of Rome that it had this right. <laughs> horrible disease around it sure. that people who were trying to invade it couldn't get in because right. of the diseases. And we have Renaissance evidence of how different areas of Rome, dis different districts of Rome had very different prevalences of disease and fevers. New arrivals to the city were always more vulnerable to infection than longtime residents, probably partly through immunity and partly through sort of understanding of how to guard themselves against. Hmm. And Rome throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance became famous as a city of fever and in fact, malaria was often portrayed as a dragon, a dragon that attacked those hmm. in the city and particularly those coming to the city. So people coming to Rome and of course, in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, people came to Rome for like papal conclaves and, you know, right. they had to come for religious reasons. And there were various, I didn't read them all, but anecdotes about 
cardinals coming to elect a new pope and you know half of them being struck with fever within days of arriving mm -hmm. and things like this so it was dangerous rome was a dangerous city because of the fever and there's stories of various saints who chained the dragon and made it less dangerous in various ways and stuff so malaria was this feature of rome from the classical period onward that was a feature of, of its geography right. essentially not known that way it was called in latin it was mostly known as well it's febris which is just the word for fever but in particular the cortana that is the quarterly fever was one of the ones that seemed the most strongly to be connected with sort of the most basic malaria but there's evidence this book was suggesting there's lots of evidence for the coexistence of the three main types of malaria in rome in the classical period right and it gets into the details of how we know this but i'm not going to bore us with that now anyway i thought that was really in, uh, quite interesting and i'll just end with a couple of famous malarial victims potentially <laughs> seneca seneca the younger suggests that claudius the emperor claudius right. died of malaria yeah. now everyone else says poisoned mushrooms right but it may be that Seneca is reflecting the official line, mm. but he doesn't say he died of malaria. But in a the satirical poem that he writes about Claudius's death, he shows him being accompanied by Febris, the god of fever, yeah. uh, to his deathbed. So that perhaps suggests that that's what it was. And it has also been argued, at least I read an article arguing it, that Alexander the Great died, again, not of poisoning, not of poisoning. but oh. of malaria. Hmm. I can put a link to that particular article if you're interested in so, you know, malaria features in some histories of some fairly famous, important people. And of course, there wasn't really any treatment. You know, there were various treatments for fevers in general, but there really wasn't much treatment for malaria other for that kind of a fever anyway, yeah. other than yeah. treating the symptoms and hoping it went away, which of course it can. You can survive malaria, yeah. but it uh, there wasn't really anything to be done about it. And that's my little treatise on <laughs> malaria. Well, getting back to the main cocktail. Uh, oh, yes, the gimlet. The gimlet. Mine is done. Mine is almost done. <laughs> Very sad. I know. Should have made them doubles or something. There's an early ad for Rose's Lime Cordial, mm -hmm. which is drawn by Edward Lindley Sanborn, a famous illustrator uh, specifically associated with Punch Magazine. Oh, yes, right. And he's particularly famous for drawing a picture of Cecil Rhodes, which has become iconic of... Oh, that's one uh, of him striding. Striding, yeah. yeah. And we'll, we'll put an image of that in the show notes. In the sure, show notes. you use it in the video. That's why I know it. Yeah. Yes. It's an icon of imperialism. Cecil Rhodes was a horrible man. <laughs> he was deeply racist. Um, after him, by the way, is named Rhodesia. And the Rhodes Scholarship, sadly. And the Rhodes Scholarship, sadly. Yeah, I mean, the money that supported that came from the money that he made through imperialist, monopolistic activities. Deeply, deeply, deeply exploitative, racist, yeah. horrible stuff, yeah. He was also one of the founders of the mon monopolistic and exploitative De Beers Diamond Company. Mm -hmm. Another example of capitalism and exploitation and go on horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I suspect those who would, you know, argue for capitalism, many people in one form or another, would argue that De Beers, that kind of monopoly is not what capitalism no. aims at. Yeah, that it yeah. isn't, you know, it isn't capitalism exactly. in its ideological sense at all. But this brings me to one of the major themes of video, which is monopolies and exploitation and colonialism mm -hmm. and the dangers therein, and specifically the, the British East India Company and, and the Dutch East India Company. So I have a few more interesting facts about those East India Companies. A subject, of course, that could be covered on... The, I, I wonder if there are actually podcasts out there that are just, just about, about those East those. India Companies, because there certainly could be, They're or at so least rich. long series of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost like histories of nations at yeah. that point, yeah. Well, the one place that in popular culture that these East India companies are probably most well known today are from the Pirates of the Caribbean yep. movies. And indeed, there was a bounty for the pirate captain Henry Every, 1,000 pounds, which is quite a lot of money. From the British East India Company. From the British East India Company. Because the East India Company has also sort of employed pirates. Yes. Yeah. But there was a bounty for, for this particular pirate captain, Henry Every, which was the first worldwide manhunt that seems to have ever happened. Another interesting little historical footnote, the building that I 
featured in the video picture of the building for the East India Company. Oh, yeah. British right. East India Company, which was East India House. That space is now occupied by the Lloyds of London building. Oh, yes. Which I find an interesting sort of quirk of history. You know, this insurance company now occupying one of the first stock trading companies. Mm -hmm. The first insurance company. Yeah. The first insurance company now now occupying the, the space that was the first uh, stock trading companies. Right. So just an interesting little footnote. But uh, since you mentioned John Evelyn, well, he's implicated in all of this, too. He made a, a great fortune from East Indian trade, mm. as did Samuel Pepys. As did everyone other, at the time. As did time, everyone at the really, time. Yeah. 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 But those two names in particular came up in connection with, with the East India, British East India Company. Right. And a few last little details about James Lind, who sort of come, came up with the cure for scurvy. Mm -hmm. He also came up with the notion of producing fresh water on ships through distillation. Oh, okay. And he recommended growing salad, specifically watercress, on ships for <laughs> dietary purposes. Which certainly would have helped them with their vitamin C problems yep. as well. Yep. And others problems. Of course. And as I say, he was generally interested in improving the conditions, shipboard conditions, right. uh, improving hygiene and so forth. So he probably did some good, even though he didn't fully understand the mechanisms behind what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, unless I should talk about gin for another 45 minutes. What's your favorite gin? <laughs> right now, it's that California gin that I don't remember the name of but that we just got recently. Oh, yes. You, but you're supposed to answer, how, how could you ask me to choose between my children? No, I really like that California gin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like all gins, and they are so very different. But most recently, there's this California gin that's got like totally different evergreen flavors and stuff like that. Oh, it's so good. But anyway, <laughs> I like gins. Lots and lots of gins. <laughs> so if there are any gin companies out there... <laughs> would like to sponsor like us. To sponsor us. <laughs> and you don't need to give us money. You could just give us gin. That would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously we're not going to get uh, sponsored by the De Beers Diamond Company. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to happen. And in bringing up the, the business plot with uh, Smedley Butler, Smedley Darlington Butler. Yeah, you have to give him his full name yes, every I time. His full name. <laughs> the chief name implicated in that, I didn't mention it in the video because I was slightly worried, worried about, about being it. sued. <laughs> sued, but it's J.P. Morgan. Right. Was... Major financial institution. <laughs> well, I don't think they were very likely to be in the market for podcast, podcast sponsorship. sponsorship. Yes. So this episode not brought to you by De Beers or J.P. Morgan, but maybe brought to you by a gin company. Or Rose's Lime. Or Rose's I would Lime. Go with that. Sure, yeah, sure. Rose's Lime Cordial. I'm a big fan. <laughs> and on that note of selling ourselves out to capitalism, <laughs> we'll wrap it up for tonight. And we'll be back soon with our next exploration of words and the world. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.